All right, well, welcome to today's webinar, uh, Equipment for Small Compost Sites, uh, hosted by the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. I'm Brenda Platt, and I'm the director of the Composting for Community Initiative at the national nonprofit, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. And today I'm joined, first I'll just introduce my colleagues, Jess Del Fiaco, um, our communications manager, and Sophia Jones, our Composting for Community Policy intern. And Jess and Sophia are gonna be helping with uh, tech and they've helped with registrations and helping with questions today. So thank you guys running the polls. Um, I also wanna do a shout out to the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's many funders. We have a lot of foundations that have been supporting our composting work over many years. But in particular, the 11th Hour Project has been supporting our community composting events and in-person forums. So thank you to all the folks at 11th Hour Project that are supporting this work. Um, today's panel, if you're here for um, equipment for small compost sites, you're at the right place. I'm so pleased to have this panel today. All of these gentlemen probably deserve their own web hour and a half or more webinar. We will not be able to touch everything today on all the equipment, the wide range of equipment that's available for small compost sites, but I'm so pleased to have Van Calvez from Green Mountain Technology, Peter Moon from O2 Compost, Peter Janis from Lower East Side Ecology Center in New York City, Pete Toth from Greenbelt Zero Waste Circle in, in uh, Greenbelt, Maryland, and then Charlie Bayer and David Klein with the New York Compost Project hosted by Earth Matter, also in New York City. So again, all of these gentlemen are amazing. Thank you for joining us today. This is gonna be a great panel. Before I get before we get started on the panel and introducing each of them further, let me just say a few words on our work uh, cultivating community composting. We convene a national coalition of community composters. Some of you are new to that coalition, welcome. We've been hosting workshops, webinars. We have a podcast, Composting for Community podcast. We have a Google group uh, for members. We have guides, policy resources, training, and videos. To give you an idea of just the past webinars we've done over the last few years, um, this is just a, a flavor of some of them. Anything from how to successfully prevent rats at community scale sites to uh, entity structure, if you're starting out and you want to figure out are you a nonprofit, a for-profit, and even within those categories, there's many different flavors. We have a great cake analogy for that. We've done another webinar, Bike Powered Food Scrap Collection, a spotlight on equipment for just collecting food scraps with bikes. So check out some of those webinars. Um, that's a link up there if you can find all of our webinars related to community composting. We have a new series we've just launched this year, this summer, on particularly for farmers interested in composting. It's on our on-farm composting and compost use series, and uh, we just had one this week that just finished with Cala Rosa Strander and Jean Bonatal on um, particularly on compost and soil and uh, we have another one coming up in November that's going to talk about um, uh, compost quality and marketing compost and then our next one for community compost is on a similar theme of how do you test compost, what to look for in a test, and that'll be December 14th. So we'll, since you joined today, uh, you'll get that information on those upcoming webinars. And for the webinars, again, or any of our work on composting, uh, we invite you to check out our website, ilsr.org slash composting. Um, so today we're talking about equipment, and you may say, well, what is a small compost site? Well, there's no clear definition, but what I do by way of want to introducing what we're talking about today, we're not talking about home composting systems, and we're not talking about centralized, really kind of commercial scale systems. We're really in this part of the hierarchy. We developed this graphic, by the way, it's the only one I know of that has this lens of scale, um, where where that big arrow is pointing, kind of looking at small scale decentralized systems, those that are at community gardens, urban farms, maybe a school, um, and then kind of blending a little bit into the medium scale, more farm scale, but not large farm scale. So that's what we'll be um, talking about today. And we're gonna do a few polls now, just to get an idea of who's on the line we did ask you this when you registered, but only we know this, so this is so we can all see 
who's on the line. So Jess is going to help me run those polls. So the first one is, where are you participating from today? So select one of these. And we like to see if we can get close to as many of you as possible answering. Got 81%. That's good, Jess. Let's see the results. So mostly from the Northeast, but we have a few from outside of the U.S. and the rest of the country, so all are welcome. All right, the next poll is, are you composting now? Yes, you're already composting. No, interested in starting. No, you're not really going to get into the field, but you're here because you're supporting others and doing it, or you fall into the other category. All right, let's see the results. All right, most of you are already composting. Some of you interested in starting. Okay, and thank you to those who are supporting composting. So the last poll is, what best describes your affiliation? So, and again, just select one, the best one. You may fall into more than one of these categories. So are you a farmer, uh, not a farmer, but a composter? Maybe you're involved in a farm service provider, research or government or nonprofit or other business or other. All right, let's let's look at the results. All right, we have some farmers, we have more than a third of composters, um, lots of kind of more in the other category. Almost half of you are either research, government, nonprofit, or other. All right, again, everybody's welcome. So with that, let's get into our panel today. Um, each of these panelists will have about 10 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time at the end for your questions. Um, feel free to, um, as you go, to type your questions in the questions um, uh, box in the GoToWebinar control panel. and. Um, and we'll get those answered. We'll, again, have plenty of time for Q&A. So with that, let me introduce um, uh, Van, um, who is a composting systems engineer with Green Mountain Technologies. And Green Mountain Technologies makes a wide range of systems for composting. Van has been the uh, composting systems engineer for Green Mountain for more than 10 years, and he focuses on their in-vessel composting systems, and he works with not only cities, but also at the community level, and he provides design, engineering, and technical support for a number of their systems, and um, he loves composting. So Van, take it away, and we can see your screen just fine. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Van Calve, as Brenda just mentioned. I work with Green Mountain Technologies, and I also am going to show you a little bit of my work doing uh, um, personally. I, I also manage composting systems for a couple of different intentional communities here on Bainbridge Island, so I'll give you a little bit of a peek into that world as well. So let's go jump right into it here, and I'm going to be showing you some of my favorite tools and equipment for composting on farms and in communities. So a little bit about Green Mountain Technologies. We do commercial composting systems. We've been in business for 28 years. We're based here in Seattle, Washington, and our mission is helping organizations compost effectively. And what we do at Green Mountain are basically do uh, either large commercial and municipal composting facilities, and then also in-vessel composting systems, which is my focus area. And as Brenda mentioned, when I'm thinking about small, in this case, I'm thinking of small, smaller, and smallest. So small, in this case, would be two to 30 tons per day inputs. Uh, smaller would be 500 to two tons per day. And smallest would be 50 to 500 pounds per day. And so you can kind of maybe find yourself in that spectrum. I'm gonna be starting at the larger part of small and work, working down to smaller still. So we do aerated st static pile composting systems. We have Peter Moon on next, so I'm not gonna say that much about this type of technology, but we do pipe on grade and below grade aeration systems. And then in terms of mechanical aeration, we do positive only, negative only, and reversing systems, mass bed systems. And so one of our specialties is web-based aeration controllers that are automated. So using 
uh, feedback from the, the, uh, the temperature in the compost piles, controls the blower, and allows you to keep your compost temperatures at a set point. So that's one of my favorite tools. It, it really automates the process of uh, doing ASP. So uh, this is an example of an installation we just did this year at Bloedel Reserve on Bainbridge. And this is a botanical garden that's super beautiful. This is a bunker style ASP design. You can see it's a fabric uh, building that they used here, which is pretty cool. This is a pipe on grade pre-engineered ASP system. They're putting green waste, uh, horse manure and bedding in this system. And this is a, on the small side of a ASP for us, this is one ton per day inputs. These bays are 44 yard bays with, that are 20 by 10 by six and 66 days on air for that primary aeration phase. So that's an example of some of the smaller ASP systems we do. Here's uh, in vessel composting systems, which are, um, excuse me here, um, are great in the sense that they prevent rodents, pests from accessing the compost. You have direct control over odors, direct control over leachate, and they're often easier to get permitted than pile-based systems because from a regulator standpoint, things are in a box. So, and here's one of my favorite mixing technologies, and I'm totally biased because I sell this technology, but it actually really works great is the, the Earthflow mixing system and mixing technology with the traveling auger that sweeps the vessel. And what I love about this system is it's so fast at blending composting. Basically what you have here is an automated mixing system. And it's, you know, because moisture tends to go to the bottom of a compost pile, this system is great at taking that wet compost and dumping it continuously on top. And we also do aeration, in-floor aeration in our composting systems. And that's super helpful for boosting oxygen levels in the compost and preventing odors. And here's a, an example of a installation that I love for ag. Um, this is a site-built earth flow where we, where the vessel is built locally and then we supply the mixing technology and the aeration technology. This is a poured concrete wall with a greenhouse roof. And you can see this is a 50 by 12 bay. So it can take 3.3 tons per day. And this is for Green Acres Farm in Cincinnati. And they do horse manure and bedding, chicken litter, and green waste in that system. Here's another example of a site build earth flow. This has a wood wall with a stainless liner. And this is a little smaller, 30 by 10, and can receive about 1.1 tons per day. And at Heyday Farm, they put pretty much everything from the farm in the system. Pig, cow manure, horse manure and bedding, chicken litter, chicken carcasses, food waste, green waste, you name it. And this is showing one of the advantages of a site-built system is, is that you can drive your tractor or your skid steer or Kubota directly into the system. You can dump, comp, you know, dump uh, entire loads directly into the compost bay. You can move material around. So it's super flexible for ag. And you can see this is a totally open air system. So there's no biofiltration here. Um, this is Full Circle Farm in, uh, in Oahu. And this is a 20 foot intermodal earth flow. This is by the way, solar powered, which we're thrilled about. And they take, uh, they do food scrap composting as well as everything from their farm. A lot of compostable service wear from events and this system handles it very well. This is University of Dayton. We just installed this system um, about a month ago. This is a 40 foot custom vessel earth flow. And one thing I'm profiling here is the tote tipper, which is a great tool for dumping food waste and other feedstocks. And they typically use a 64 gallon toter for this. A shout out for biochar, UD is putting biochar in there, uh, doing tests with biochar in their system. So I thought that would be cool to show you. Here's an example of a bucket loader, which is super helpful for materials handling. Pretty obvious, but still uh, the food bank just got one of these. So they were thrilled to, to get this tool available. Here's some examples of feedstock compost storage, which work really well. Um, these are bays for storing either your feedstock or your carrying compost. Um, here's some examples of some biofilters, which are super helpful for odor control. And you can see the aeration systems there. And here's an example of a smaller wood uh, container biofilter and the large particle size we recommend and use for that biofilter media. 
and they're uh, super effective, of course, for filtering odors. Can you compost inside a building? Yes, you can. Uh, typically, the biofilter and the exhaust, uh, as you can see in the left here, would, goes outside the building. Um, but otherwise, you're able to compost inside. It's totally doable. And then you get some, the passive heat gain from the heat coming off the compost can help heat your facility. Here's an example of an earth flow with, that is totally bear proof for Shenandoah National Park. And uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, now we're moving to smaller scale. This is an example of Cook City Schools is one of our favorite earth cube customers and they compost year round in extremely cold environments and are very successful. And another thing I want to shout out about the earth cube is, is that you can move these around with forklifts and pallet jacks so you can move your compost pile, which is kind of cool. And then uh, this is also Cook City School. They, they have this greenhouse um, where they do closed loop composting and they take their compost from food scraps and grow more food. So I thought it was so beautiful. And here's some dog waste composting. Earth cubes are great for composting pet waste. Here's an example from Battery Park City, City Parks where they compost uh, dog waste from their dog runs with newspaper, wood chips and sawdust. And now I'm changing hats to show you some of my top secret work I'm doing this um, is uh, composting vessels I'm building out of trash, reclaimed materials, um, scrap wood. As you can see there's pallets I'm using here in scrap wood and really having fun with, you know, how can we make composting vessels less expensive, less resource intensive? Here you can see I'm using political signs for the liner for the inside, and this is reclaimed old composite decking for the floors. Um, this is uh, a a project I'm doing for a preschool in Seattle at Discovery Park. And this is made completely out of reclaimed materials. And here's, I've been collecting garbage from my neighbors for a long time. And so I do a bottle breaking project where we have uh, people stuff milk cartons with plastic trash. And then, oops, excuse me. Um, and then we make a brick and then we can insulate the walls of our composting vessel with that and so we've got trash on the outside and compost on the inside and so i love it so uh yeah for more information feel free to visit our website at compostingtechnology.com i thought this was so cute someone may be a, a heart out of compost so that's super fun and we like to have fun around here so thanks so much for having me be a part of the presentation Thank thanks you. van as you can see uh, everybody how challenging this is to present all this amazing information in less than 10 minutes so well well done we have a bunch of questions but i'm only going to ask you one so see if you can do the the quick answer um man so okay. for a one cubic yard bin what is the minimum input per day in a forced air system to achieve sufficient temperature wow that's a great question i would say minimum input uh you know, I think it, it's a practical matter. You know, we, we put very little inputs in some of these one yard bin systems and they still function fine. They just compost more slowly. So, but I think you need to be in the realm of, you know, maybe 10 pounds a day um, would, be, would be nice in order to really get the value out of that system. And is that 10 pounds just the food scraps or is that 10 pounds of everything going into the I'd system? I'd say 10 pounds of everything. The maximum that I recommend for a one yard container is going to be around 50 pounds or about 10 gallons. Um, so that's really the more, more important number. Composting doesn't matter how, how little stuff you put in there. It's just going to compost more slowly. Um, but the max is uh, be 10, 10 gallons, 50 pounds. Okay. So Van, feel free to check out the questions in the question control panel and see if you want okay. to answer those and uh, reply all so everybody can see. And I will um, introduce our next speaker, which is Peter Moon. And I should have said at the beginning of this um, that in our panel, we have starting off with Van and Peter Moon with companies that are producing these systems and rounding out the panel with uh, folks that are using either branded systems or do-it-yourself systems. Um, so we have uh, 
the green belt and, and um, Lower East Side Ecology Center and Earth Matter are actually community composters. But I am so happy to have Peter Moon here today from O2 Compost. He's a founder and principal engineer there, and he has over 30 years of experience in this industry and with a focus on aerated static pile method of composting. And he has worked with every imaginable type of composter, uh, lots of farms, lots of small-scale systems, and so welcome, Peter, um, the mic is yours. Uh, thank you, appreciate it. Can you um, see my screen okay? Yes, just go to presentation mode, and okay. I think that, yep, you'll be good. Here we are. There you go. Okay. Uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, participate in this panel and um, shout out to Van. I really enjoyed your presentation. Like Van, I have been in the composting industry for quite some time and also reside in the Seattle, Washington area. Uh, so for us, it's uh, morning time. Good morning. Um, what I'm going to be talking about very briefly but quickly is uh, aerated static pile composting, which is... Uh, for all of our systems, the the means of composting. Uh, and the objective here is to take raw feedstocks, in this case food waste, and convert it into a high quality soil amendment and using a, a very simple technology. For those of you who are not familiar with ASB composting, just a very, very brief overview. Uh, we are inducing airflow into the pile uh, therefore, it's aerated and static. We are not turning the pile in the first 30 to 45 days of that phase. In this case, we're, you see a cross section. These are um, uh, the pipes where the air is coming in. We have a layer of material, uh, typically a bark type material for uh, displacing or, or distributing the airflow across the base of the pile. We have our mix which is a day-long conversation in itself. And then key to ASV composting is a cover layer referred to as a biofilter cover. It, it provides insulation so that we can achieve temperatures throughout the mix to destroy pathogens as well as parasites, weed seeds, and control fly larvae. Um, it acts as a biofilter for odor control so that we're retaining the volatile organic compounds and as well as the nutrients in those uh, gases and um, and controlling odors, minimizing impacts to neighbors. Uh, we're uh, uh, retaining nutrients, uh, predominantly nitrogen. We're creating a barrier for vectors, um, um, uh, rodents, birds, flies, and we're able to help uh, retain moisture in the system, plus it improves the aesthetics overall. So that's a quick overview. Here's an example of a partially constructed ASB system where we have, uh, in our case, a simple timer. We have power coming in to a simple timer, operating a, uh, an inexpensive blower, feeding air into a solid pipe manifold, which then distributes air into these lateral pipes. The bark chips here are over uh, the perforated zone. And then this is the green waste that's been uh, constructed over the first two of those four pipes. Here's an example of a system that um, is fully constructed, uh, a very simple farm-based system. But we don't have to start on that scale. Uh, one of the um, um, devices that we provide is a what we call our micro bin system, very similar to what Van was showing you with his reclaimed materials, which I thought was an excellent example. Um, here is the blower delivering airflow into a simple manifold. This is a, pi uh, a plywood box example. Here's a tongue and groove example of the same thing. These are four by four by four feet, about two and a half cubic yards of, of volume. This is a rather fuzzy picture, uh, but looking down, the blower delivers air into the manifold, and then we have aeration uh, perforated pipe uh, inset from the walls on all sides by about a foot and two feet um, uh, between the two. So it's a very, very simple air delivery system. Um, these can come in different forms. On the left, you see a hexagonal um, bin with four by four foot panels, six panels. 
That's the Solana Center, which is a nonprofit organization. They're composting food waste in Southern California. And on the right is Phoenix Press Farm in Connecticut. This is a system where we have three bins conjoined, but the same uh, method of air delivery uh, as I showed in the previous slide. Uh, now we're going to show some scaled up versions of the same thing. This is a horse farm in North Carolina. It's built into the hillside so that they can deliver the horse manure from the high side and then recover it from the low side. Another top-down system, uh, somewhat larger in Sterling, Massachusetts. The system has been operating for better part of 18 years, very successfully very low profile, very low input. One thing I would mention is all of our systems take advantage of a cycle timer to turn the blower on and turn the blower off. And um, for these types of systems, we find that this is really advantageous, both in terms of cost, but in terms of simplicity as well. Um, everything that we do strives for simplicity. At some point, it becomes imperative to use a higher degree of technology, such as what Green Mountain has uh, demonstrated. Uh, but in these smaller scales, we find that a simple uh, on-off cycle timer works great. This is a food waste composting and horse manure situation, Thatcher School in Ojai. Um, this is what I would call a block bay system. Aeration is built into the uh, concrete slab in trenches. It's not a pipe on grade. And this is also a solar powered system. Uh, and then the larger scale, this is a an extended aerated static pile system. Uh, it's also food waste in Royersford, Pennsylvania. And basically you start constructing one pile at the far end and then keep adding pipe as you bring in material. And so over time it gets uh, uh, larger and larger. So aerated static pile composting is very, very scalable and, uh, and, and easy to implement. Um, so how do you get started? What I recommend is a pilot project. This is, again, an example of our micro bin system. It's quick and easy to set up. Um, startup time is very short. It enables you to prototype your compost mix. So if you're working with something that's a little bit challenging uh, and, and you want to make sure that you have a good mix before you go to a large scale, it's very good for that. Again, here we're looking at our carbon to nitrogen ratio, bulk density, and moisture content. It helps us confirm the suitability before uh, setting up a large pile. A lot of folks who are thinking about getting into composting but aren't altogether sure this is a great place to get started simply to say, is this really what I want to do? There is work involved. There is uh, physical labor involved, and it's a great way to determine that. And then it's also a good way to get uh, stakeholder buy-in. So, for instance, we've worked with a number of universities, and there's many layers of decision-making going on. So if you can show them that it doesn't smell, it doesn't attract rodents or flies, there's no leachate that we're generating cause surface and groundwater impacts, they're far more apt to buy into the program than they would be if it were just a spoken concept. So on a larger scale, again, for pilot projects, um, we're providing operator training, resolving logistical constraints, and this is really a key point. You don't know what questions to ask in a feasibility study until you've actually done it. And when you set out to construct a system and operate a system, all of the logistical constraints come right to the surface. And it's by resolving those constraints that you learn the most about uh, what you're trying to do and, and again, getting uh, um, stakeholder buy-in. Uh, it allows you to test a variety of mixes, establish standard operating procedures. In this case, it was a landscaping company and they had a number of different people working on it and so they wanted a, a, a standard set of procedures. Um, it'll also help you uh, determine what permits are going to be required, if any. Can you work below a certain threshold and, and get permission but not go through the, the arduous process of getting permits? And then again, establishing regulatory uh, confidence so that the regulators say, no, these guys know what they're doing, leave them alone. Uh, 
Here's an example of a startup uh, in Maryland, Ocean City, Maryland, a client, uh, Garvey Heiderman. On the left, uh, a year ago, he started with one of our microbin systems, started out as a cube, but then expanded it to a hexagon. Uh, hexagon, by the way, holds about six cubic yards versus two and a half for a cube using the same four foot by four foot panels. And then this year he expanded that into a freestanding aerated static pile. All of the uh, uh, feedstocks come from restaurants in Ocean City and he's just completed his second year and is now looking to expand it further. So that's uh, what I wanted to share with you today. If you like to learn more, feel free to go to our website, o2compost.com, and I'm certainly available to answer any uh, questions that you have. But thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Um, we have a lot of Peters today, so I'll be saying that a lot. So we're going to hold questions, uh, Peter Moon, for you. There's some questions that came in I think would be good for the whole panel, too. So um, let us move to the next Peter, Peter Janis, who is um, uh, the uh, manages the Lower East Side Ecology Center in New York City's uh, hauling and composting operations. Um, there's uh, been a little bit of um, developments recently. Peter, maybe you'll talk about it or not, just on the city's support for that particular site <laughs> and whether you're being kicked off that site. But uh, Peter's here today to talk to us about the equipment that he's been using there. They've upgraded um, at East River Park where they've been operating the facility stormwater management system and they've implemented their turn window as well as ASP composting. And before that, he helped to um, uh, launch the Queensbridge compost facility, which uses another ASP system um, that was under the Queensboro Bridge when he worked for Big Reuse. So Peter Janis, welcome. And um, why don't you um, start sharing your screen? So we can. There we go. Okay, you're good to go. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the introduction. I'm really uh, humbled to be here. Um, I'm definitely representing more of the the DIY uh, end of the spectrum. Um, but I'm from the LES Ecology Center, which is a long-standing community uh, composting uh, nonprofit organization. That's our sort of main program. There are other programs, um, but I've been managing the composting operation there for about four years. Um, and this is uh, what it looks like from above, just to give you a sense of sort of the scale and scope. This is roughly sort of what happened over the last four years while I was there. Um, it was historically uh, used these in-vessel uh, systems, or just one big in-vessel system that was just kind of over capacity. Uh, as the collections grew over the years, um, it just wasn't really matching up to what we were taking in. So I slowly sort of converted the system to a sort of combination of turned windrows and ASP system, which is pretty experimental, um, or I should say was, because uh, the site has been closed. So this is all uh, historical information now. Um, but this is uh, how we sort of started our days uh, tipping out our trucks, um, which as they got larger, we found a need to um, sort of stage some of the material. So this is kind of more of just like a basic sort of mechanical concept uh, that maybe people don't really talk about. But as we scaled up, it became a, a huge issue to be able to stage these barrels that we were collecting and then tip them, um, you know, be able to aggregate them. So uh, we constructed this platform and that kind of became also a mixing bay because that's where we're tipping them from. Um, and so uh, that's where we you know, blended feedstocks and then would heap uh, the material onto our uh, active windrows down there. So that was just kind of our, um, it's like a little, it seems like a minor sort of innovation, but it really saved us a lot of time and energy throughout the week. And here's just sort of a glance at our ASP system, those familiar little fans. Um, Charlie, who's up next, advised me on this system, and I couldn't find the fan that he recommended. I did a lot of research, and I found this uh, greenhouse controller, which really only used this top third of. It's a cycle timer with uh, these push-button controls that are very convenient, so I find that 
to be very easy compared to some of the options. And then the housing is just the repurposed uh, garbage can, basically, and a milk crate. Um, so originally, the screening was more of like a volunteer uh, project, where it's kind of like a hands-on educational thing where people could sort of touch the compost. So we had these screening tables that would receive the overs coming out of a, a small uh, worm harvester, and it was fed by hand. <clears throat> we also had a slightly larger one that was also, you know, fed by hand. Um, but as we scaled up, it became apparent that you know we needed to get through something like 100 yards a month, which you know, shoveling by hand was a lot of work, even with a lot of volunteers helping and probably just wouldn't really happen. So I got to tinkering with some materials that were just laying around the yard and uh, put together this chute that um, fed into this larger worm harvester. This isn't really vermicompost, but this these are the this is the equipment that we had. Um, and so that allowed me to load it with the with the bucket with the bobcat. And so we were able to get through those uh, larger volumes uh, quickly enough to sort of keep up with the pace of incoming material. Because um, our site was very constrained. We didn't really have uh, <clears throat> the luxury to sort of spread out curing material very far. Um, that screener did still provide uh, sort of opportunities for volunteers to get involved. Um, it would get kind of gummed up if, um, you know, the material was a little moist and there were still contaminants for people to pick out so um so that was you know engaging but kind of laborious and then eventually we were able to upgrade to a, a sittler which was much much more efficient um we ended up putting this little sail over it to catch debris there were some leaves and things uh, in the trees above us, birds. We couldn't really trim the branches because we're in a public park. And um, so that seemed to solve the problem. And then we also added these little panels to just sort of hold a little bit more material and separate the overs and um, screen material. Uh, here's another little construction with some odds and ends. It's just a, a mixing bay. So we had been making potting soil by hand um, for years and Again, as it scaled up, it just became sort of impractical. So we threw together this little bay, which doesn't really look like much, but when you're handling this material all week long, <clears throat> it really saves a lot of time. Um, and then bagging, we distribute um, a lot of finished compost just to community gardens or street tree stewards. Uh, and we had volunteers fill those bags. Um, we also sell some bags at the green markets uh, where we where we collect our food scraps from the public. Um, and we do that all by hand, which is uh, one of the bigger bottlenecks in our operations. So we are looking at um, some small bagging machines that are available. Um, and then stormwater management, the, the site historically had some really uh, sort of troublesome stormwater uh, issues, drainage. Uh, so we were able to address that um, sort of like a months long project involving multiple volunteer groups, but we basically built a whole network of French drains around the site and in the worst sort of lowest, most degraded area created uh, this rain garden. These are sort of before and after shots. Um, so, you know, it's something people sometimes overlook when they're thinking about a compost site, but, you know, in a big heavy rain, it becomes really obvious uh, where the drainage issues are. And so we were able to sort of turn that into a, a little resource. Uh, you know, again, uh, we're an educational program. So this was, you know, an opportunity to, you know, teach people about native pollinators and water cycle in general. Um, <clears throat> but again, that, that whole site has been closed. So we're now uh, a mobile operation. We're collecting food scraps uh, at all of the same um, drop-off sites, but we're taking them to the compost site on Staten Island, where they'll be processed at a much larger sort of industrial scale facility. And uh, we hope to figure out um, where to start a new site. So I really appreciate the uh, information I've already got from the other presenters. And, um, <clears throat> and stay tuned for more updates about the uh, LES Ecology Center's composting operation. Thanks, Peter. Um, and for those of you who are 
type in your questions for Peter in the question box, please be sure to add the last name so we can know which Peter to direct them to. All right, we're just going to keep going so we, because I think some there's some questions on the cost of the Sittler, and I know Charlie and David are going to talk about their Sittler screener, so maybe we can pick up the screening questions. Um, with the whole panel at the end. So let's move to Peter Toth, who's with the Greenbelt Zero Waste Circle in uh, Greenbelt, Maryland, which is just outside of Washington, D.C. This is an all-volunteer run effort. Uh, I think there's more than 60 families that are involved now, and they've been supporting the circle, a number of community really run composting activities, including a couple of three-bin um, uh, compost systems that are not ASP, as well as um, a few wigwams that are on the back, the loading dock of a local restaurant. So they have really harnessed the power of volunteerism to, you know, build their screeners and do it yourself. And I'm really pleased to have Pete Toth here today to talk about um, some of the equipment, and not just the bins, but the equipment that he's using to help the system. So Pete, uh, why don't you start showing your screen? Okay, can you see my All screen? Right. Yep, looks good. All right, and if you're not presenting, the rest of us can turn our uh, cams off. All right, Pete, the mic is yours. All right, uh, everybody. So <clears throat> I'm uh, relatively new to composting. I got involved less than a year ago. So everything I know, uh, I learned in the last year. Um, so bear with me if I say some things that are like uh, at kindergarten level. Uh, so our uh, our operation, we have two sets of uh, of four, four foot cubes, uh, four foot three bin, um, the three bin cube assemblies. Hey Pete, uh, would... I'm just gonna just interrupt for one second. Uh, for some reason, for your slide showing, it's showing the next slide too. I don't know if that's something you want to adjust. Ooh. It's showing the current slide, slide, and then we can all see the next slide. It's not terrible, but I just didn't know whether you wanted to fix that. Let me see, let me see what I can let me see what I can do yeah, about might... that. I am you an know, IT it's... professional. I should be able to master this thing. Let's uh, stop, and I'll let me see if I can show the other screen. Uh, is that better? Uh, we're not seeing. Yep. Okay. Yeah, we're seeing one. Go to the next one. Let's just make sure. Yep. It's okay. a little small, but I think we're good. Okay. Uh, so uh, our uh, operation consists of. Uh, this is kind of uh, the, the flow here. We uh, put the stuff in the bins first. It sits there for about six weeks. Then it moves over to the uh, to the worm condos, and it's all put together by volunteers. We process about a half a ton of waste per batch, a batch every six weeks. Um, everything needs to be mobile. Uh, everything other than our uh, our storage bins, uh, we need to take home with us. So uh, that's one of our limiting factors. Um, <clears throat> We process uh, food waste from the co-op, uh, about uh, maybe 20, 30 pounds a day. Uh, maximum capacity would be about a half a ton, uh, half a ton per batch uh, every four to six weeks. We need to shred stuff because uh, uh, we found uh, leaves tend to, to mat together, uh, food, waste, uh, food waste clumps together and goes anaerobic. And also the wood, uh, the uh, larger wood chips tend to clog the grate at the bottom of the the uh, worm uh, worm condo. So we've uh, started with a, uh, a gas shredder. I'm going to try to play this video, and if uh, if it sounds too loud, just yell. But uh, the idea is, uh, I don't know if you, I don't know if you're hearing the yep, hearing the sound, good. but it's just an ordinary uh, homeowner style. Uh, leaf shredder, um, <clears throat> great for shredding uh, leaves and small sticks. However, for vines, it's just an absolute disaster. Um, so what I ended up doing was getting uh, a uh, flower stem trimmer uh, that's intended for a flower shop, and I uh, chopped the vines into manageable pieces. If uh, if I'm putting them in the shredder, I'll cut them into like foot long pieces. And then throw them in the shredder. If I don't feel like getting the, the gas powered shredder out, I'll just cut them into like one or two inch long pieces. Or if it's like seven o'clock on a Sunday morning and don't want to wake up the neighbors, I can just uh, just go completely manual. Um, this is a food waste shredder, uh, electrically powered. 
stainless, the body, uh, the body of it is uh, works on the same principle as a paper shredder. Uh, two uh, two axles, counter rotating blades, about 10 millimeters, um, 10 millimeter wide, um, thousand watts, uh, 36 volt DC scooter motor powered by by three batteries, and I think I've got a video of it here, so we can see the little uh, bite sized pieces coming through, kind of low volume. Um, so uh, we, we don't we don't end up putting everything we process through this thing just because we have too much for a single batch. Uh, also, the thing needs a little little prodding. You have to poke it, and we've got another view of this thing here. Uh, the rectangle there is the the active area of it. So even though it's got a big mouth on it, uh, it's only got about right around a third of it is the part that actually chews stuff up. And uh, we can see this thing in action right here. Um, this is kitchen waste from uh, from my house. And so you dump this stuff in, poke it a little bit, chops it up real nice. And uh, I think we got a little more here. And I thought this thing would just be just magically chew this stuff up, dump it in, uh, chew it up, but it, it needs a little needs a little more manual manual intervention that, uh, than I was thinking. But still better than uh, a little better than what we were doing before, which was uh, chopping things with uh, with ice scrapers in buckets. We were, we're still doing that just because we can't uh, process everything through uh, through this thing here. Uh, one disadvantage of this electric shredder is it chokes on apples, believe it or not. Uh, so I got this uh, friend, this potato slicer for making French fries. Uh, and as you can see, it's not a high volume thing, but um, maybe I'll get better at it or mount it on something uh, to, to get apples split up. Uh, just some comparisons for, uh, for shredding options. The gas leaf shredder, uh, it's fast and entertaining, especially when you put food scraps in it. But uh, Food scraps, they say it's suitable for food scraps, but they tend to get liquefied and they ferment instead of decomposing uh, and also release moisture too quickly. Um, the bucket and ice scraper, uh, it's low tech, um, which means you can get a lot of them because it's low cost and uh, you can get a bunch of people doing it at the same time. The kitchen waste shredder, uh, output looks really tasty. I wanted to just reach in there and start eating that stuff sometimes, but, uh, but I haven't. Uh, Chokes on whole apples. Uh, that is the uh, ideal size for for shredding stuff, but it's not quite the volume that uh, that we're looking for. Uh, and the potato slicer, yeah, that's kind of cool, and I'm hoping to uh, be able to get that to to chop stuff up a little better. Um, we were considering using an immersion blender, but I think that would make um, that would make smoothies, uh, which is not the kind of stuff that we want to get uh, for our for our piles. Um, and we considered, a, uh, so just a review of the power sources. Uh, it, uh, I tend to go like towards electric because I'm a technology kind of guy, but uh, we point, people have pointed out, you know, since we're a, a community-based operation and the volunteers come around, people want stuff to do. So we give, give somebody an ice, scrape, ice scraper and, um, and they can chop stuff up. Uh, electric is good stuff. It's quieter than gas. Uh, we are limited uh, because we're limited to 110 volts. We're not wired to mains with three-phase power and all that kind of stuff. So we're limited to about uh, one and a half watts, which or one and a half kilowatts, which is about two horsepower. Uh, with a battery, you can go like 3,000 watts, so kind of close to close to the power we get with a, a normal size gas motor. Um, the gas gas engines, I think, are about like six to eight horsepower, so we're kind of in the same ballpark. Um, gasoline still is uh, has its advantages. They're commodity products. They're uh, unfortunately they're loud and environmentally unfriendly, uh, and we are looking to replace those with uh, electric stuff. Um, and just a comparison of chippers, um, the, the thing we're using right now is a combination uh, chipper and hammer mill shredder. Uh, it has a chipper thing on the side for chipping up branches and making our own wood chips out of branches. Mostly we just dump stuff in the, in the hammer mill shredder part of it because that'll chop up leaves and, uh, uh, leaves and, uh, leaves and small sticks. Uh, this thing doesn't have a dis discharge chute, which would be better uh, for if you're shredding somewhere and want to fling this stuff into your pickup in the back of your pickup truck and, uh, and drive it home. I tried an electric blade chipper, the ones that they call uh, a silent one. Um, they're inexpensive and I thought that was the answer to all our problems, but uh, it's not so good for, for dry wood and it's uh, really hard to feed stuff into it because it's kind of like uh, stuffing leaves into a mail slot on your front door. That's the size of the, the um, opening on it. Uh, electric string leaf shredder works pretty well uh, if, you're, if what you're chopping up is just leaves. Uh, 
one good thing that I'm looking at that's not available here in the US, they've got electric shredders uh, available in Europe that use 220 volts, which approach the power of gas shredders. So uh, maybe if we can figure out some way to wire those into American current, we can, um, we can make use of those. Uh, and another kind of nifty thing I came up with uh, is uh, using a pipe coil for storing things. The, the, the cool thing about that is once we, uh, you know, after it sits for about a week, you take the coil off and it stands by itself and it looks like a big chocolate cake. Uh, so that's good for the final phase of curing when the fungus takes over and it needs to just uh, sit for a while. Uh, also, uh, store, we also uh, cure the stuff in, our, in the normal um, three bin, uh, standard three bin thing that you see in a lot of community gardens. Uh, and for sifting, we use a trommel sifter built by Michael Travis, bicycle rim trommel sifter using quarter inch hardware cloth uh, and bicycle rims and casters. And we thought about putting the motor on it, and and uh, I, well, I, I like to put motors on anything, anything I can. And, and uh, we pointed out, well, you know, people like to have fun. People enjoy spinning the thing, so we'll save the motors for something else. Um, and just some uh, acknowledgments uh, to contributors and volunteers: Beth Lamont, Danny Lewis, Hallie Ayer, and Michael Travis, Laura Rosenthal, and Michael Hartman. City of Greenbelt Department of Public Works built the built the three bins for us and also gave us a place to put them and uh, lots of volunteers who have to show up to shred things, chop, mix, carry scraps around, wash buckets, sift castings, feed the worms, uh, provide storage space and uh, hang out at the farmer's market and tell our story to the people who come by and say uh, what's, in all those, what's in all those bags. Um, that's it. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Um... I think every volunteer community-based uh, composter needs a Pete Toth or a handy guy who's willing to try all these things. It's pretty amazing. And I have um, been lucky enough to visit in person and see some of these things in, in action. So um, let's round off. Let's, let's have our last um, uh, panelist. It's going to be actually Charlie and David, Cl Charlie Bayer and David Klein from Earth Matter a nonprofit in um, New York City on Governor's Island. And uh, one of the things I love about Earth Matter, their uh, compost education demonstration site. So they have microsystems from home composting, communities, you know, garden scale all the way to farm scale. And um, so if you have questions on not just the composting systems, but the ancillary equipment, um, these guys can answer it. So Charlie has um, is the operations manager. Uh, David Klein is the organics recovery coordinator, and they've been at this for many years. I think Charlie, you've been at it for two two decades. So um, your slides are up. You look good. So uh, the mic is yours. Uh, good afternoon to you all, and thank you, Brenda, for including us in this presentation. Earth Matter is a nonprofit that is dedicated to reducing the organic waste that's misdirected into the waste stream by encouraging neighbor participation. And you can go to the website earthmatter.org to sort of look at all our programming. Today we're going to talk about what we consider small scale to medium scale operations. Uh, we are located on Governor's Island and uh, I should say we're in, in these operations we're principally funded by the Department of Sanitation through the New York City Compost Project. On Governor's Island, there is currently a landscape of transformation. It's a military installation from pre-revolutionary times up until 1996, and it's currently owned by the City of New York. The Trust for Governor's Island is charged with its maintenance and operations and future development. Future development phase one is what you see in the upper portion of this slide with all the curvilinear pathways snaking their way through 40 acres of brand new park. Uh, the Coast Guard was the last service to occupy the island, and they left behind the group of townhouses that are in the lower portion of the slide, intended for family housing built in 1980 and not slated for future uh, use. We took uh, part of this site in uh, 2014, and what that principally consists of are many of the parking areas between these buildings. So they're all the same, about 60 feet wide and 120 feet long, and uh, nicely, nicely graded. So we've got a hard surface that drains well for the most part. And we're gonna take you right into, we've elected to do 
a limited number of, of things with this presentation rather than cram a lot of stuff in. And we're going to take you into one of those parking lots and look at what happens on a regular weekly basis. Great. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks for having us. My name is David. I'm a RDNX Recovery Coordinator at Earth Matter. And so I'm going to be talking a little bit about our skids, some of our skid steer techniques for uh, blending mixed feedstocks. Uh, here you see an uh, image of the receiving area at Earth Matter. We receive about 10 to 15,000 pounds of food scrap every Monday delivered to us by partner organization Grow NYC, who collect the material at food scrap drop off sites throughout New York City. Uh, in addition to this, we add about 2,000 pounds weekly of post consumer organics generated on Governor's Island. And this material contains a high percentage of compostable serviceware. Um, here you can see the food scrap being tipped onto a base of wood chip on the right and a base of yard trimmings on the left. Uh, after materials have been tipped, we amend with additional wood chip and leaves as uh, needed. Um, the, let's I'm gonna play a little video here. So the two piles are um, folded together, keeping the yard waste trimmings on the bottom um, being weighed down by the other feedstocks. Uh, then using the skid steer with the pallet fork attachment, we lift the yard trimmings up through the material. In this way, we blend the feedstocks um, and break up the knotty yard trimming. Um, we use this, uh, I'm just gonna I'll let it play, but I'll let you know that we also use this forking technique at other phases in the piles on the site, um, such as uh, for redistributing moisture or breaking up compaction and also to assist in drying at the final um, stage before screening. Uh, once we've uh, after we've lifted both sides of the pile with the forks, uh, we switch back to a light materials bucket. Uh, we approach the pile at a 45 degree angle and turn about a third of a bucket worth of material at a time, uh, turning each side of the pile and then reversing angle and turn each side of the pile again. Um, as you can see, happening right here. And uh, this technique, uh, it really allows us to turn a pile uh, within its own footprint, which is uh, very helpful because we do have limited space on site. Here you can see approaching from the other side of that pile. Um, and of course you can you can hear the crunch of the uh, compostable uh, cups. Uh, after the pile is blended, um, show off a little bit more of the turning here. After the pile is blended, uh, we place that material onto our phase one ASP. And again, approaching um, the pile at a 45 degree angle, uh, building out the pile, uh, alternating loading from either side of the pipe. Uh, this approach really helps us to achieve the height of our phase one piles um, uh, within the limited uh, space that we have. So we really limited aisle space around the piles. Um, and there at the end, you can see the pipe and, and plenum. It takes about uh, four to five weeks of received materials before we filled out a complete uh, phase one ASP. But I'll hand it back over to Charlie now. Oops, there we go. Screening with the Sittler. Uh, Brenda asked me to focus on, on equipment, particularly screeners and shredders and chippers and mixers. Uh, we're gonna get to see the Sittler in more detail and, and a, uh, a mixer. Uh, I didn't include try and include uh, any shredders, but we can uh, talk about that in the Q&A if, if people are interested. Uh, I think the, the biggest point about the Sittler is its accessible price, but with the small price uh, comes a small size. Um, if you're talking about overall uh, productivity and efficiency, it might not be the one to to purchase, um, but it's certainly uh, easily easily affordable. Um, yep, we can go ahead with the video. It the screen measures about four feet by about 42 inches, and we've chosen to have all three screen sizes on separate drums because switching screens is is a, a pretty difficult task. You can see we're approaching here with the full size. Uh, uh, light materials bucket. I believe the machine is best suited for a regular dirt bucket. You can see as we tip into the into the hopper, the blade of a regular dirt bucket would probably be right at the edge of the hopper instead of extending down into the hopper. That's not a uh, a place you can. The edge of the hopper is not a uh, a place you can. 
jostle the bucket. It's not that strong. You can see behind us, we're not screening with the brush. This material is very dry, uh, rising right up to the 12 o'clock point. And here we're checking to see how well we're doing. We don't see many fines dropping out onto my wrist. We're looking at the overs and coming up into focus. You can see there's still a bit of material clinging to those overs. We're probably a little over 50% moisture content and we'd like to be ideally a little bit under. Looking at the screen itself, uh, most of the material is dropping out in the first panel. And again, this is a quarter inch screen we're screening quite fine just to be able to remove the uh, UPC stickers. We like clean compost. We'll come back to this later, but do pay attention to the small amount of material that is coming back on the feed belt, on the return side of the belt. Again, going into the box to pick out a bucket of material, you can see that clearances are a little tight coming up here and a regular dirt bucket might be a little easier to work with. In the background there, you see that we've attached uh, shade fabric to the fencing that surrounds the machine. We've chosen to leave this machine in one place to begin to achieve its best operational efficiencies. And that uh, screen of fabric is a wind barrier. We uh, had some difficulty, we're right there in an open space with the primary westerly wind uh, tending to mix some debris back into the finished material. So going into a little bit more detail with the Sittler and what we think is a common problem with it uh, is the belt sometimes stops. And it's a little bit mysterious the first time it does and I wanna just quickly run through what's actually happening. We looked previously at the return belt coming back. Let me slow to that slide. There we are. And what's happening is a little bit of that material that's on the belt is actually getting deposited under the belt, between the belt and the guard, the sheet metal guard that protects the bottom of that belt. And the trick is to know when to pull that belt out before there's too much material. And often you don't, the belt just stops. So we developed a little DIY. DIY technique for pulling that, that sheet metal guard out. You can see in this photograph, just between the roll, just below the roller, the edge of that sheet metal is folded down. It's not really anything you can get a grip on uh, when there's a lot of resistance. So, next slide. We've here in this slide, you can see we've clamped a piece of two by three to that lip and use the clamps and a piece of chain to hook a come along, secured to a nice solid spot to pull the sheet out. It takes a little bit of force to get it moving, but what you really want is just a slow, steady pull. And it's important, we didn't show this in the slide, but it's important as that sheet metal pulls out, you're gonna lose a lot of material off the bottom of the belt, and you don't want that dropping into the engine or the chain drive that's that's otherwise not protected. So you have to lay in some piece of plywood and some tarps to keep all the rest of the machine protected from what's falling out. So that's that's it. Uh, happy to take more questions about the Sittler uh, in the Q and A at the end of the program. The next piece here, uh, we just thought uh, you'd enjoy seeing what what can be done when you have 17 tons of pumpkins and 400 bales of straw uh, and a JLOR A50 feed mixer. Uh, we're going to run the video, but first I want to just say things to look for. You can see in the beginning the mixer has replaceable blade edges, um, and we're loading heavy materials on top of light materials. So the straw goes in first, the pumpkins go in after that, and the blend is is uh, much more easily made that way it is a mixer right it's not a grinder um, you can get a little bit of grinding action out of it if you've got a coarse material like wood chip running through it at the same time um, but it's it's principally a mixer so this is something you can all be doing in another couple of weeks here we go
Thank you all so much. Let's go Thank to you. Questions. I love the ep the name ep and the music, the epic pumpkin video that it was. Um, thank you guys. So let's let's just there's a lot of questions on screeners, and I think there's also questions on on mixers as well. But let's just start with this screener. So, um, what is um, the and we could um, uh, all of the panelists, you can turn your um, webcams on. And um, yes, so I'll start with uh, Charlie and David on, on the uh, on the, and then um, Peter Janice on the screeners. But what is the capacity of the Sittler screener in terms of cubic yards per hour? Was one just very specific question on the Sittler? Very very good question, uh, Peter. You can answer as well. But we seem to be able to get about six or seven cubic yards screened uh, per hour. Not Peter Jan, you about the same? Is that your experience? Peter Janice, we can't hear yeah. you if you're sorry. Gary's um I don't know that we ever really got a good uh, sort of average. Um so we don't we don't really do like extended uh screening because we're pretty small scale, but it seemed really variable depending on the um you know the moisture levels. And um, like Charlie pointed out, the belt sometimes gets jammed up. Uh, and so, you know, it really also, yeah, it depends on sort of the patience of the operator and whether they can avoid getting those jams or if they're trying to overload it. And so there's a lot of variables. Um, so I don't really have a, a measurement. I think the uh, manufacturer had some pretty high numbers that I don't think we were ever able to achieve. So. No, it depends. Yeah, I loved yeah. Um, Charlie how you said the Sittler screen is very affordable, and I was laughing because I work with so many really small scale sites. So, and and uh, Peter Toth, you know, you saw the bike, the one bicycle rim, repurposed bicycle rim screener, which you know is probably like five hundred dollars or less, and the Sittler screener is what fifteen thousand. Dollars just to kind of somewhere, somewhere around there, but but I think the point, the larger point is simply that the the price jump between that and and the next available models of a similar size is is quite large. You're up at at least fifty or sixty thousand dollars. Yeah, and more. And Van, you were, were did you want to weigh in on the cost of screeners? Well, having built the ones with bicycle rims, that those are way less. But it is, it, it, you know. What is affordable depends a lot on your scale, and certainly I think the settler is is super affordable at that scale. Um, yes. But for a small community composter, the bicycle rims is is not a not a bad idea. Assuming you need to screen at all, a lot of us don't screen at all, right? So just avoid the whole screening step. Yeah. Um, so. Um, Let's talk about shredding because there was a lot of questions that came up about shredding actually throughout the whole session. So, um, uh, real quick, Pete um, Toth, a quick question: Is your shredder assembly homemade or purchased? So, yes or no? Mm -hmm. I, I purchased the the shredder body, the 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 actual core of the thing of uh, uh, from a guy in Germany who makes these things specifically for shredding uh, food scraps, and then uh, I added the the base and the and the motor power. And do you think Greenbelt, you've done all this kind of innovative do-it-yourself stuff. We, we, are you guys able to make some of your designs available to others who are interested, or are they already available? Some of this. Uh, well, 
I, I think I made all this stuff up myself. Uh, therefore, it belongs to me and the, the whole universe that fed me with all the ideas that I built this on. So anybody who's interested in this stuff, uh, uh, just about everything I've shown you is either mine or I found it on the internet. So if anybody's interested, send them my way and I'll provide details. Okay, great. Um, and just a follow-up question, Pete, because you know it, it seemed like you're taking a lot of care to do that size reduction in the initial mix. And there was one question, does that enable for the three stall bins? Does that, like, are you are those still being turned and aerated? Or is it now pa more passively breaking down because you're doing all that size reduction up front? Can you just talk about how that impacts the process for you and perhaps saves labor at the other end? Yeah, so um, we, we are still, uh, when I say we, I mean Danny. Uh, Danny, I think, uh, conscientiously uh, turns the piles pretty regularly. So uh, the... Uh, the extra care that we take to to break this stuff up uh, st still still requires us turning because we don't have any aeration, but it does give us a, a better finished product and uh, prevents uh, prevents the final product from jamming up the the grates at the bottom of the of the worm condo. Okay, great. And Peter Moon, there's a question. Do you use any grinders or shredders to decrease material size before adding to the ASP system? So. Uh, yes, absolutely. The, the, you want a spectrum of particle sizes, but in the grinding, you're also mixing. Uh, the higher the surface area, the faster it's going to break down. But uh, grinding does incorporate available carbon with available nitrogen. And and at some point you're of course adjusting the moisture content going in, um, but yes, if if you can, you don't have to, but it it's optimal. The, the objective I think overall is to have a as homogeneous a blend of materials as you can, which was very well demonstrated with uh, uh, Charlie's uh, video there and David's video. I thought that was really fun. Yeah, agreed. Um, and maybe this question for Peter Moon, you and Van, because you both have those kind of mi micro, um, you know, cubic one cubic yard <laughs> systems. So that it's kind of related, maybe you already answered it, but can you add a mixer to the small compost bin? That's the way the question was worded, but I don't know if the mixer is part of the bin, but maybe you can address how important yeah. mixing is with the really micro systems. You would want to mix it prior to putting it into the bin, so it wouldn't incorporate it as a integral part of the bin itself. Van, any yeah. what's your experience? What I would add, I'm I'm sort of a laissez-faire composter, and um, so typically I'm doing aerated static, static vessel, but we have used augers like a bulb planter, which you can find at uh, Home Depot or on the internet, attached to power drills, will produce a similar blending uh function and it works reasonably well at, at speeding the compost process um or you can just use air and uh, it'll compost more slowly but it'll still get there if you're uh, got a good recipe it's all about good recipe to get to those uh, high compost temperatures yeah i'm glad you mentioned the auger on a power drill we have a number or some of our community composters that are doing just that call out to the site in rhode island who's doing that so and pete toth are, haven't you done that too added something to a power drill am i remembering that wrong oh yeah i, I tried the I, I tried putting a power drill on that uh the shredder thing that has the scooter motor on it and uh yeah it not so good uh, power the um <clears throat> rigidly attached scooter motor works a whole lot better oh, oh so, yeah and i did i did try doing an auger for mixing things in a bucket and yeah that didn't work out so well either i, I can tell you a whole lot of stuff that didn't work well, that's always good to know. We need to know what works and what doesn't work. So all those lessons learned are great. Um, Van, a question about mixing and the, talking about augers uh, for the Green Mountain Tech systems. Any yeah. lim the question is, any limitations to be aware about the auger used in the Green Mountain Tech systems? Yeah, yeah. All all technologies have their limitations, and and for the Earthflow auger. The things that it doesn't do well is it doesn't uh, work with fi long fiber, like tall weeds will tend to wrap, long fiber straw will tend to wrap around the auger, plastic bags it doesn't play well with, um, anything like that that's going to want to wrap and the auger typically has teeth on it, it grabs things like that really readily. 
Um, the other thing that the earth flow doesn't handle well is our really dense feedstocks. So wheels, um, you know, or which means often very wet feedstocks uh, will cause the auger to, to go ug because if it's like cookie dough in the compost, it's, it's a lot of stress on that mixing system. So we say bulk densities need to be below 900 pounds per yard uh, in, an, in an earth flow in order for the thing to, to not kill, kill your auger. Anybody else have any other thing to add to augers and what prevents them from working? <laughs> All right, let me, uh, Van, a follow-up question for you on the, on the earth cubes. Somebody said they look like IBC totes with a cutout. Is that true? Yeah, that's absolutely true. So an earth, an earth cube is, uses an IBC-based platform. We're essentially taking IBCs, reclaimed IBCs, and making them into composting systems. And that's absolutely true. And we also offer uh, kits um, to, and to support other folks retrofitting IBCs into compost vessels. And then the last, the ones you saw at the end are essentially a wood construction uh, earth cube. So, uh, but yes, that's absolutely the case, IBC based. And that's why they are movable. With their, that's what why they already have a built-in forklift pocket so you can move them around, absolutely. Right. So ingenious. Um, so a question, I'm going to start with you, Peter Moon, and I think, Van, this is for you too or anybody else, but this has to do with, is a half uh, horsepower blower too strong for a 4 by 4 by 4 bin? It seems that quarter horsepower blowers are hard to find. So Peter, any comments you want to make on the power of the blowers or anything about that? Yeah, all of our micro bin systems use quarter quarter horsepower blowers, and I think that's more than ample. A typical cycle time would be 30 seconds on every half hour or thereabouts, and you can get, a, a, we've recently started using a, a brand that seems to be very reliable called X Power that you can get through Home Depot and they're in the hundred dollar range and and so yes i would suggest a quarter horsepower not a half horsepower for that scale of operation all right yeah good and van anything about the blowers yeah. for your systems i'll have to pull up for our for our one yard systems what what the blower is i'll put it in the in, a, in the answer to the question i don't know what that is off the top of my head okay all right um and uh, Charlie and David, you're using blowers too. Anything you want to add about your experience with blowers in general, the timing, the ability? I know you focused on the screeners, but just to give you an and, and Peter Janice, I'll come to you next if you want to add anything on this since you have a lot of experience with ASPs. But just from the actual operator, any advice around blowers? Sure, Brenda. Uh those of you that visited our site back in 2019 may remember that we were using at that time uh, the uh, GORE system with the mobile power unit. We still have that system, but with this demolition that's occurred around us, we've been disrupted and haven't reinstated it. We had a chance to set up the uh, solar panels in a much better spot, so we're working on that. Um, but what using that system taught us was that uh, Actually, in those larger piles, we're looking at 160 to 180 cubic yards in the big ones, that a frequent blower time on time was better to maintain oxygen levels at, at a, a narrow range. Um, so two minutes on, six minutes off in that kind of range uh, in the initial, initial stages of things. Um, Half horsepower blowers for most of our other work. You know, we're using it, using those in combination with the Gore system, uh, seem to work just fine. Um, we do have the advantage of uh, having uh, an oxy temp meter uh, to measure actual oxygen levels in the piles. Um, that's been a terrific help. You can learn a lot from temperature alone and uh, uh you know odor in the pile and that sort of thing but but to be able to put the meter in and find out what the oxygen level actually is uh teaches you a tremendous amount peter janice anything on your asp asp systems that you want think others could benefit from learning um i think yeah maybe it shouldn't really well 
I should I should say that uh, we really only had ASP on our um, sort of like older piles, our uh, like initial sort of uh, active piles um, were just mechanically turned. Uh, kind of, we had certain constraints around our, our site. So um, that's why I said it's sort of a combination. Um, and we were, you know, we had plans to sort of regrade the site and implement ASP everywhere, but we just never, we never really got that far. So um, it was in a certain section and uh, it was really just kind of done by feel um, there are no you know there's no feedback no probes or anything it was just kind of like every time we'd break the pile down we'd see kind of like how far in my interpretation sort of how far the ra the air reached you can kind of tell there's sort of like a different sort of texture and um, look to it as you're as you're going through it so that was that was one of the ways I was trying to gauge the effectiveness, um, but it was really just a, a very like small scale kind of hands on thing. I think our biggest windrow was maybe 70 feet long and then there were like two, but one smaller one. Um, so it was really something we could just kind of look at and then adjust and then look at it the next month and adjust it. And it you know, wasn't too uh, high precision, which um, I think a lot of people are, are worried that it, it has to be so high precision, but um, you know, it, I found it to be pretty effective uh, the way we were we were using it. I have a question I, for. Go ahead. I, I just have to agree with everything Peter said. <laughs> you, you can you can do it by observation and feel for sure. Um, one one little technical aspect there there seems to be some discussion about whether the plenum should be over the pipe or under the pipe. We're operating always on hard surfaces. And we tend to put the pipe down first on grade and add the plenum over it. Not everybody does it that way, though. Peter Moon, you probably have something to say about that. I, I would agree. I, that's how I do it. But I did have a question for Charlie, too. Uh, in the 150, 160 cubic yard windrows that you're aerating, what size blower are you using for those? They, that, that can be done with a one horsepower blower. Okay. Yes. It does depend on it does depend on the uh, the porosity of the pile, the bulk density, and the porosity of the pile for sure. Right. Right. Thanks. I wanted to ask, kind of move the conversation to something a little more broader. That I've been getting a lot of inquiries from various sites around the country around. So if you're, let's say, you know, an urban farmer community garden, and you you know you can't the three bent system like what uh, the green belt circle has for their kind of household drop-offs they're not really at a community garden urban farm so they're not dealing with all of that you know uh, end of end of season pulling out the plants and whether it's tomato plants or a whole row of, of um, you know stalks Charlie and David I know you have a lot of that where you are at um, on Governor's Island at the site and I think you've done a really good job kind of you know educating gardeners or the urban farmers when to chop things and what can go in but my question has to do with the scale at what point do you recommend that you can't do the you know do you kind of move from the micro three bin or the hexa hexagonal peter moon the one that you had with the guys go green in, in um, ocean city maryland to kind of having to move to a asp or a kind of longer windrow for capacity or the bunker systems that van and, and Peter Moon, you 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 showed in in a, in a number of your slides. Like, where's that sweet spot where you can't really do the micro and you got to do something a little bit bigger? Um, uh, Peter Moon, I'm going to start with you because you just deal with so many kind of farmers as well as it seems in, you know schools, universities, institutions. So, how how do you decide? Um, that's a really good question. The, as I say, the four by four by four cubes, about two and a half cubic yards. Uh, personally, I get tired of turning piles and shoveling. And, and so if, uh, if you don't have a piece of equipment, chances are you should get one. But I, I would say, you know, uh, six uh, sided, six cubic yard hexagons, that's a lot of material. Um, so I would say somewhere in that neighborhood, you're going to start looking. Everything we do is about chore efficiency. And and a, a front end loader, a farm tractor, you'll never regret 
buying one, using one, leasing one if you can't afford to buy it. But that's really the the main tool that you're going to end up using. So I would say for me, anything over two and a half, three cubic yards, if you're doing it on a routine basis, um, shoveling is going to get old real fast. Van, I saw your thumbs up. <laughs> How do, you, do you, how do you help when you're, you know, got a client, you know, do you, do you have to have them do a waste audit first to figure out the volume of the materials they want to handle? You know, is there some part of the process involved in like that? Yeah, what I always say is, is you're going to have to spend resources one way or the other. It just depends on if you have labor, if you'd rather spend money on labor or rather spend your energy on labor or we'd rather spend it on capital. And that's, that's, you got to spend it one way or the other. So yeah. depends on if you have muscle power or if you have money. One of those two is going to need to be employed. And the more stuff you have to compost, the the more you're you're going to need one way or the other. Peter Janice, for you, you know, you're kind of doing a little bit of hybrid. Um, you're not really at a. I don't know. Are you are you you know you're just you're taking food scraps generated from. You know, you're not dealing with a lot of urban farm waste as well, right? So, no, no. yeah. It's, and Charlie and David, I mean, you're a demonstration site, so you're showcasing all these different sizes. Do you have any general guidelines that you work with for others interested in replicating what you're doing in terms of how they choose which system fits? Uh. I, I think both people have touched on it. It's this equation of, of labor, time, materials, and money uh, to figure out how to engineer your process. Um, uh, you know, we, we've moved in the shredder thing, we've moved through three different levels, right, as our capacity has grown. Um, we also have learned to assess what we're doing from the perspective of do we really need to be doing this what would happen if we didn't do this um, and often that works out just fine uh, we've we've been overthinking something and and uh, can eliminate something out of out of the the process you know yeah so we have a, qu a question what was the name of the oxygen meter i think it was oxytemp uh, Charlie is what you yeah. mentioned yeah. Um, yeah. and then Rio I'm gonna add, what was that from Rio temp from Rio temp is the manufacturer REO temp makes the oxy yeah. temp okay um, uh, uh, van a question for you what do the manual labor needs look like on the earth cubes or some of the other smaller vessel composters that don't utilize a bobcat or front-end loader and if you could do a quick answer, I'm going to just wrap up with one question for all of you. Okay, uh, sure. Quick answer depends on how quickly you need to compost those materials. I'm lazy, so I like to do laissez-faire style composting where I just build a good recipe and let it sit. I don't mix it at all. So the only labor is discharging the vessel, and that's one to two hours. Um, if you wanted to, if you needed to compost faster, then, then more blending and mixing is necessary. Um, so how's that? Perfect. All right. So here's my final question for you all, since we have two minutes left. And by the way, for those attendees who are still on, a survey on the webinar is going to pop up when we close out. So please take a minute just to fill that out. We would appreciate that feedback. But here's the question. If small scale operators have a limited budget, what are the most important pieces of equipment to prioritize? And the way I'd like to do this is you don't have to explain, just name them. So Pete Toth, I'm going to start with you since you're really small scale. And it could be do it yourself, but what are the most important pieces that you need? Uh, well, you got to have bins, uh, bins, shredders. Uh, Wow, I shouldn't have gone first. I should have let other guys. Okay, go. we'll circle answer. back. Peter Janice. <laughs> um, right. Can you can you just say the question again? Yeah. It sounds, for, it for, if you're on a limited budget, you're a small scale operator. What are the most important pieces of equipment to prioritize? Oh, uh, equipment. Wow, um, it's a big topic. I, you know, I don't think you can really narrow it down to, to one thing. You know, every compost site needs like a, a series of processes to be successful and you really can't like eliminate 
one and, and prioritize another. You, you've got to have everything. And so depending on the scale that you're operating at, you, you might need to have you know larger pieces of equipment at every stage or smaller pieces of equipment at every, every stage. But you have to go through every stage and maybe you do it by hand. Um, but that was something that we learned as we scaled up is that you've got to scale everything up together. You can't leave one out. Good, good answer. Charlie, David? Yeah, I think I think Peter Peter nailed it there in terms of uh, yep, scaling everything up. Uh, you know, it used to be a good fork. That's all you need. Uh, aeration might be it might be the next thing on my list. So you're not forking as frequently. Van. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would say is what's what is small? What's the scale? I, I, I don't I don't know yet. Um, and I need to know the feedstocks and the constraints. So what for yard waste composting is completely different than food food waste composting. So need more information to answer that question. Peter Moon. My question to the question is what is a budget? Um, I know that with our micro bin systems, you could get fully set up couple bins, all the aeration equipment, everything you need, plus sand tools for around $1,500. So if that's within budget, that's what I would recommend. If you can afford $25, I'd say get a good fork. All right, well done, gentlemen. Appreciate your time. And uh, again, I apologize for only giving you 10 minutes each. That was clearly not enough. So we'll do more of this. So thank you all for participating today and do take the survey. We do uh, read everybody's feedback. We have one last poll we'll do right now, but the survey will pop up as well when we close it. So thank you very much. Thanks, Brenda. Thanks, everybody. It was awesome. All right. Looks like yes, we had I appreciate just you putting this all together for us. You're welcome. Looks like we had just the right amount of information. Okay. Take care, everybody. Okay. Bye. 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 <laughs>